Good evening, art lovers and literature lovers, and a special welcome to our friends from the Monterey Bay Aquarium and our college president, Dr. Walter Tribley. I am David Clemens, the founder and coordinator of the MPC Great Books program. And let me take a moment to thank a number of other people, Jeanette Haxton, who designed our poster, Michelle Brock and Rosa Arroyo for their many favors and kindnesses, Walter Rice and the Monterey County Weekly for their longtime support, Jeannie Evers of the Monterey Herald, Ruth Killens for scheduling, the MPC Library for hosting us, and the APGAR Foundation who funded this event and who have given so much to the MPC Great Books program. Tonight we're extremely fortunate to have with us a unique individual, Matt Kish, who combines within himself two worlds, the world of visual art and the world of books. Matt is both an artist of prodigious talent and a librarian. This evening he's going to tell us about his obsession to create an artwork for every page of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, 552 pages one a day for a year and a half, which became the astonishing book Moby Dick in Pictures. Like Ahab's quest for the white whale, Matt's journey was intense, dangerous, and deeply personal. Moby Dick has mesmerized artists of various mediums, including actor Jack Aronson's arresting one-man dramatic presentation. There have been several films more or less true to the text, usually less. John Barrymore's silent film ends with Ahab killing the whale, getting the girl, and looking up to heaven, waving as an intertitle reads, thanks. The closest film version is probably the 1956 John Huston production, which Matt saw as a, as a boy, um, with Ray Bradbury as screenwriter and starring a highly unreliable mechanical whale and a reliably mechanical Gregory Peck. <laughs> Frank Stella produced some dynamic artworks. There's been a TV miniseries with Ahab played by Captain Picard of the Starship Enterprise. A 2010 film is set in a submarine and performance artist Laurie Anderson staged a multimedia Moby Dick in which Ahab dramatically appeared on giant crutches. This clever stage business turned out to be because during rehearsals the actor had fallen into the orchestra pit and broken his ankle. And there is even now an opera in which Ishmael has vanished entirely and been replaced by a new character named Greenhorn. And there are multiple print editions, from the Aryan Press with boxwood prints by Barry Moser to the cartoonish graphic novel version by Will Eisner. Interestingly, Moser decided not to illustrate any of the novel's dramatic occurrences, saying that Melville's words must be allowed to conjure those images. He did implements, he did animals, he did all kinds of things, but he didn't do any action. Matt Kish's approach was entirely different. He was not remaking Moby Dick, and he was not illustrating. He might disagree with me on this, but we'll find out. I, I say he was not illustrating. He was making art in response to Melville's masterpiece, one page at a time. He wanted in some way to master the novel. Melville's contradictions, enigmas, parables, and his incandescent, violent metaphysical speculations. And how could he without mastering his own profound response to Melville's language in the form of visual art. Great art stops you when you see it. You simply halt and contemplate what you see someplace outside of time. That's what Matt Kish has achieved with Moby Dick in Pictures and Heart of Darkness. When you see a work by Matt, you stop and stare. Shipmates, it's time to weigh anchor. Please join me now in welcoming aboard Matt Kish. I almost feel like he said everything that I was going to say. Thank you. Good night. Um, uh, thank you, uh, definitely, for, for bringing me out here. I am. Can you all hear me? Okay. 
I am a, a public librarian in Ohio. And so this is actually only the third time that I've been in California. So this has been an incredible, incredible trip in a number of ways already. Uh, and the kindness that has been shown to me by the college and everyone that I've met here has, has really been extraordinary. So thank you for all of that and for coming out to listen to me. Um, you can look at me if you like, but the screen is going to be far more interesting. There will be uh, almost no words up there and lots of images. So uh, if you can't see this one, the two on the side may be a bit brighter. I'm going to tell you a story, actually. And this is um, a rather informal talk. I, I don't really know how to create a, a persona. So you're just going to get the real me. And I'm going to tell you about this book and where it came from. I have sort of been saddled with this label of artist, which is not a term that I was ever comfortable with. I am entirely self-taught as an artist. The last art class that I took was in 1987, a basic drawing class as a freshman in community college back in Ohio. Since then, everything has just been hard work, uh, lots of trial and error, lots of error. Um, and just continuing to push forward. And so because of that, you know, the, this label, this term, this word artist, which I think is kind of a loaded term, is not one that has ever been a comfortable fit for me. For many years, I made art in, in total obscurity. And so it didn't really matter. But now that I've been fortunate enough to have these two books out uh, and to have apparently gained some credibility and visibility, it's, it's something that seems to have stuck with me. So I struggle with it. but. I will, I will cop to it if I must. Uh, it took me a very, very, very long time to realize that making art is um, really how I record my life, my own personal history, and in a sense, my identity. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, because I had gotten to the point where just before I began this Moby Dick project, I was going to stop making art forever. And I couldn't let that go. But I didn't know why at the time. It was only after completing this and then completing a second book and then thinking about it for years and years that I really came to that realization that art is sort of the, the backbone, the spine of my identity. And to let that go would be, in a sense, to become a completely different person. When this book first came out in October of 2011, I did not really read any of the reviews because there's nothing to be gained from that. If you read a positive review, you're probably going to get an overinflated sense of your own self-importance. And if you read a negative review, uh, you're probably just going to feel worse than you should. So I didn't read any, but my wife brought one to my attention. And that review said of this particular book that Moby Dick in Pictures is as much about me, Matt Kish, as it is about Herman Melville and his novel. And when she first told me that, I was intensely uncomfortable with that. I felt that it was monstrously arrogant to, to place myself on that level with with not only this book, but with Herman Melville. And it was really only until, uh, it was only recently, uh, maybe January or February of this year, that I finally came to really understand that and believe that it is true. I think it's probably one of the most accurate things that has ever been written about my work. So in order for us to understand this book, how it came to be, uh, we have to go way, way back in time and understand where it comes from. So I was born into this. My parents were avid readers and also uh, great appreciators of illustration and art. So almost by magic, I'm the first child. I was born into a house that was completely and absolutely packed with illustrated books, picture books of all kinds. And so long before I could even read, before I was even attending kindergarten, I remember uh, pulling these books off the shelf and paging through them and looking at these astonishing illustrations. My very, very first memories are of looking at art, um, not of reading, not really even of my parents' voices, but of looking at these images. And this had a profound effect on me, because from a very, very early age, I was conscious of the fact that these pictures were telling a story, that there was a strong narrative element to these. Uh, you know, my mother had read me these books, so of course I was aware that there was a story, but I didn't really need the words. I found that with the pictures themselves, I was able to get a strong sense of what was happening. And what I loved the most about these illustrated picture books in particular was that the images built on one another, and there was a relationship between all of them, and they seemed to, to be 
greater together than they were as individuals. So again, that sense of story was really built up through repetition. My father was uh, an avid reader of science fiction and fantasy. And I remember growing up in a house that was full of towering stacks of these amazingly, lividly, luridly illustrated paperbacks. And I wasn't allowed to read these for a long time, even after I became a reader. I remember my father would say that they were too spicy for me. <laughs> that was the term he used. It took me a long time to even understand that. And then they didn't seem all that spicy at all when I really read them. But uh, I used to play a game once I was able to, to pick these up and read them. And the game I would play was that I would scrutinize these covers. Again, very conscious of the narrative element of these illustrations. I would scrutinize every single detail on these covers. And, and I would build up this belief that somewhere within the covers of that book, somewhere in the story, all of these things, these characters, these places, these ideas, these things, they would all be illuminated. They would all be explained. So it became almost a kind of mystery to me. You know, when will I get my answer? And if, when I got to the end of the book, the cover had been explained to me, I considered the book a success. If not, I was outraged and vowed never to read anything by that author again. Uh, for lack of a better term, my parents were filthy hippies. And so in addition to these amazing picture books and illustrated uh, books of mythology and folk tales and fairy tales, in addition to all of those science fiction and fantasy paperbacks that my father had cluttering the entire house, there were also stacks and stacks of vinyl records. And again, as someone who was so drawn to imagery and to art, I spent hours and hours and hours staring at these and reading the song titles on the back, you know, these were all concept albums, which seems to be such a dirty word these days, but back then it was apparently the thing to do. And I loved the fact that in reading these song titles and trying to figure out how they corresponded to the elements of these covers, that again I was being told a story by pictures. Comic books came into my life at I think just the right time, and for me, they seemed the perfect synthesis of everything that I was looking for. They had narrative, they had art, they had text, they had a story. Everything that I was looking for as a young reader was contained within the covers of these four color fantasies. Uh, I am old enough to remember, and I think maybe a few people here are as well, when admitting that you read comics was a source of deep shame. There was an incredible social stigma to, to letting it slip that you read comics. You know, when I was in junior high and high school, if that knowledge ever got out, it would essentially be like admitting that you had planned on being a virgin your entire life and living in your parents' basement. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. So for me, it's been kind of fascinating to see the way that comics have gone from being this, uh, this source of deep shame and yet, in spite of that, something you craved. It was almost like an addiction. But this source of deep shame to something that is now so easily and publicly acceptable. I mean, there are comic book television shows. There are billion dollar movie franchises. No one thinks twice about taking their date to see the Avengers. And back then, you would have gotten slapped. Uh, and, but I was really fascinated with them. I loved comics. And the thing about comics that was so fascinating to me then was, and, and even now, is that you know they, they seem to work best when these stories take what's an essential human truth, and they exaggerate it to these incredibly cartoonish proportions. So there's still the fantasy. There's still this sort of outrageous exaggeration, and yet there's some deeper human truth to it all. I learned an awful lot from reading comics. This is where we actually start to get to the connection with Moby Dick. When I was in elementary school, uh, my father used to take me to my grandmother's house to she had a better television antenna. Remember, this was the 70s. And so there was no cable television. There was no streaming anything. You got what your t antenna gave you, and you liked it. Uh, so he would take me to her house, and, and I would spend Saturday mornings and afternoons watching these monster movies. And so again, for me, these were a tremendous source of excitement and inspiration because they were very much of a piece with the art that I had been looking at, the books I had been reading, the comics. You know, I lived in a world where the mundane seemed very, very mundane, and the world of my imagination was, uh, you know, the thing that I craved. And so this is the last piece of the puzzle, and I'm going to bring it all together here for you. Video games. 
Uh, I was there for the dawn of this all. I remember when these came out and really changed the world. And again, what fascinated me about these was, yes, there was a certain level of interactivity. You were pressing the buttons, you were reading dialogue, you were occasionally making dialogue choices. But these were still visual narratives. You know, I loved the art. I loved seeing the story actually occur in front of me and sometimes actually having an opportunity to influence that story. So all of these things that I've shown you were really what filled maybe the first 15 or 20 years of my life. And the thing about these images is that I remembered them all. I absorbed everything I saw. Every single one of these images and many, 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 many more became a part of my inner landscape. And I've always had this, I don't know if it's an ability or a curse, but everything that I read, every piece of fiction in particular that I read, I see. And by that I mean I see what's actually happening in the story, in my mind. I'm not, it's not that I'm saying I see the words on the page, of course I do, or I couldn't read them. But reading for me is an intensely visual experience, and as I grew and as I absorbed more and more and more of these images, these were what sort of populated the stories that I was reading, and in a sense this is a big part of what became the visual database that I drew on so heavily for my reactions to Moby Dick. I had been drawing for my entire life. Ever since I was a very, very young person, I had been drawing. But in my late 20s, I had started to take the act of making art very seriously. A lot of that had to do with all of the things that I showed you so far. I felt that it was time for me to sort of reverse this flow. This constant intake of images needed to be reversed, and I felt the need to illustrate my own personal mythology. These are some of my earliest drawings. Um, I spent an extraordinary amount of time on these, and what I had hoped to do with these when I showed the very, very small handful of close friends that I shared them with was to convey to them, again, a strong sense of visual narrative. I wanted it to seem as if these were really pieces or images or illustrations of a much <clears throat> larger story, a very personal story, a, truly a personal mythology. And even though the reaction to them from these friends was always very positive, they never got that sense of a narrative. They always reacted to them as single images, as static images. You know, they would say, wow, that's a really cool drawing, but that's about it. And so I tried and tried and tried and worked at this for years and years until I eventually sort of gave up in frustration, and I turned to trying to make my own comics. And here are some examples of those. And what you'll notice if you've um, ever read a comic is that these really aren't comics. They're more like picture books. There are very, very few panels. There's very little of the visual language of comics. These are really just big drawings with words sort of pasted onto them. And so after trying this for a few years and again meeting with a sense of frustration and, and kind of a sense of failure, uh, I had to admit some things to myself. I was certainly not the best writer and I was not the best storyteller either, so I considered these a failure as well. By this time, I was 40 years old, and uh, finally to the point where I felt that it was perhaps time to give up the making of art forever. I always think of this particular painting, which is not by me. This is by my father-in-law. And I saw this painting when I first visited my wife at her parents' house. Now, to meet my father-in-law, you would never imagine he was the kind of person that would create something like this. He is a, a Filipino nuclear engineer and about as dry as they come. But this is one of the many paintings he produced when he was a young person. And he stopped painting very, very early in my wife's life. She says that she has vague memories of being a young girl and seeing him stretching the canvas and applying the paint with um, knives and, and other tools, but that that doesn't extend much beyond when she started schooling. And so we often have talked to one another about why it is he stopped painting, because he's not the kind of person that you can easily ask this of, and he probably wouldn't tell us if we did. So we sort of came to the conclusion that given what we know about his character, he had just had a daughter, he had just come to the United States, he had landed in a career that was both demanding and well-paying, and we figured that he probably decided his primary responsibilities were to his family and his career, and that the making of art was something that he needed to simply set aside because it wasn't as important as those two things. Now, I had just turned 40 years old, and although my wife and I do not have children, there were some parallels there. I had finally landed in a career as a public librarian. That was my third career. Uh, that I was finally really very passionate about. And it is a fairly demanding career. There are conferences. There is continuing education. It is a challenging career to be a part of. 
40 is a sort of arbitrary boundary. I mean, it's not really a whole lot different than turning 39 or 41, but it's one of those ages where we sort of like to look back at where we've been and forward to where we're going. And I had been making art seriously for over a decade and not really had any kind of success. Now, I have to accept some accountability for that. I hadn't really tried very hard, but I had made some attempts, and I had had no luck getting a gallery show, no luck doing anything other than Xeroxing my comics at Kinko's and passing them out to friends, and really no luck getting anybody to see my art online other than the very few friends that I had shared the link with. So I had finally realized that perhaps it was time for me to just put this all aside and move forward, but as I mentioned before, something wouldn't let me do that. It was like giving up a part of myself. So I spent that whole summer, that summer that I turned 40, the summer of 2009, just sort of agonizing back and forth, not sure what to do. It was an awful state to be in. And then a few things actually sort of strangely bubbled to the surface of my mind. The first is this project, which I'm guessing many of you are familiar with. I had seen Zach's work for Gravity's Rainbow, I think in 2006 or 2005. And uh, it's, it's an absolutely staggering body of work. The ambition of it alone was, I think, a big part of what attracted me to, to what he had done. I simply couldn't believe that someone had actually attempted this, let alone succeeded. And so this had been sort of floating around in my mind for many, many years. And another thing that sort of bubbled to the surface again was seeing this come on television for perhaps the first time to me in, in decades. And so I started watching it again, and I went all the way back to those early days at my grandmother's house. I mentioned before how my father would take me there on Saturday mornings and afternoons while he ran errands. And this is where that, that connection between Godzilla and Moby Dick comes in. So one particular day when I was eight years old, um, he was running late, later than usual. And I remember watching the end of the final monster movie and seeing something else come on the screen. And I, had, I must have missed the credits or the title. But right away, there were people wearing historical costumes, and there were ships with sails and rigging. And as a, a rather obnoxious young person that I was, I instantly associated this with history, which I also associated with school, which I also associated with super boring. So I, I stopped really paying attention, but since there was really nothing else to do, I sort of stared vacantly at the television screen. And within a short amount of time, this monstrous white whale began appearing on the screen. And I have these vivid memories, particularly of the eye of the whale looking out at me from the television screen and feeling this really incredibly palpable sense of malice and hatred from what was apparently, as you said, an unreliable mechanical whale. It was a deeply affecting experience for a lot of reasons. One was that I was literally terrified, more so than I had ever been in any monster movie anywhere. Another thing that was astounding about this for me was that it truly made me feel as if my brain was exploding because these two worlds, that boring world of reality and school and history, was colliding with this world of the monstrous and the fantastic in ways that I couldn't even imagine were possible. So I was absolutely glued to the screen as an eight-year-old. I watched the entirety of the remainder of the film. I didn't even notice that my father had come in behind me and watched it until the end. And I turned around and he explained to me, again, as a reader, uh, you know, and as a kid growing up in a house full of books, he explained to me that this was based on a book called Moby Dick by Herman Melville and that what I had seen on the screen was more or less the story. A few days later, my father brought home for me this and I had lost it for many, many years, and actually through this project of mine, someone uh, dug up a copy and sent it to me, and it's a real treasure. Uh, yes, it's actually Moby Books up there in the corner. Um, and I, I loved this book because it was my first experience with being able to move through the story at my own pace. The other thing that I loved so much about it was that every page was faced with an illustration, these beautiful little scratchy black and white pen and ink illustrations. This book is actually really hilarious, so I'm going to show you this cover again because I highly recommend tracking it down if any of you are fans of the original novel for a number of reasons. First of all, it is uh, 100 pages of text, so you can imagine that a great deal of it is stripped out. It is truly, simply the story of the chase for the whale. The other thing that is really kind of amusing about this all is that um, 
the, the ending is left rather ambiguous. There's no uh, Ahab killing the whale and getting the girl, nothing quite that awful. It's pretty clear that uh, Ahab meets an untimely end and Ishmael survives, but the remainder of the crew of the Pequod, they just sort of disappear off stage, and I think that that was done to perhaps spare the children this was intended for. So what is particularly notable for me about these two first experiences with Moby Dick was that they were visual. This story came to me as images first, not a book, not words on a page. It came to me through both the film and these illustrations, were, which were what I actually looked at first before even beginning the reading. And that was very much of a piece with the person that I had been up until that point, observing, uh, absorbing all of these images, seeing everything I read. So this Moby Dick seamlessly dovetailed right into my life in such a perfect way that it instantly felt like an old friend and I couldn't really imagine what life had ever been like without it. So all of these things came together that summer that I had turned 40 years old and I had decided <clears throat> that what I was going to do was try one final ridiculously ambitious project just as Zach Smith had done. What I wanted to do was to create for myself the illustrated version of Moby Dick that I had always seen in my mind as a reader. I wanted to take those images and make them real. I wanted to, in a sense, go out on top having done something that I was incredibly proud of, that I knew I would regret having never attempted, and that would mean something so incredible to me that I would always, always uh, feel attached to that moment. So, and I wish my wife were here because she always laughs at this portion because it's absolutely true. I began on August 5th with absolutely no planning whatsoever and no forethought, no idea what getting engaged in this project would actually mean. I decided to illustrate every single page, one page per day, and I started with this edition. Um, I felt like there would be two possible outcomes to this. One would be, of course, what I mentioned earlier, that idea of having created what was for me this definitive illustrated version and having ended my artistic career such as it was with this task. The other thing which I thought was a vague possibility at the time and actually turned out to be more realistic was that I would rediscover what the making of art actually meant to me. And it took years. It took years after I began this. It, you know, it took until this year. But I really did rediscover what it means and how it shapes my life and how it is sort of an external memory of who I am. I chose to use this edition, this particular edition, and this is very important for my illustrations. There are a few reasons for this. One is that it begins with chapter one on page one. So all of the, uh, the sub-sub-librarians' extracts are given Roman numeral pages, and Call Me Ishmael begins on page one. And for someone beginning this journey as an artist, that seemed absolutely appropriate. I did not want to begin on page 12. That just seemed strange to me. The other reason was that I've always been incredibly fond of this cover. Uh, it is very easy to go into any bookstore and find dozens of editions of Moby Dick with historically accurate photographs and etchings of the American whaling industry. You can find Scrimshaw. You can find the classic illustrations. And those are all well and good. I don't begrudge those the, their existence. But what I always liked about this cover from a contemporary artist named Klaus Hoey, who I think may still be alive, uh, and if not, he passed only recently, was that this was <clears throat> a very modern piece. It was a very modern look at the story. And what resonated about that with me was I almost felt as if the publisher was saying something that I had always known, which is that this book is not dead, not boring, not uh, you know, uh, something that should be forgotten about, but is still an incredibly relevant, vibrant, living, and important book that speaks to us all even now. Even So this, was, this would have been, um, I think, 2001 when this came out, the 150th anniversary. Uh, but, you know, 150 years after Melville set pen to paper and this book is still being published and still being promoted and still being explored by artists. So I gave myself just a few rules. And those rules were one page per day. A lot of people want to know why. Why that rule? Why one per day? I knew that if I did not give myself that kind of awful, bruising, horrendous discipline that this project would quickly become like that weight bench that you buy thinking you're going to become a competitive bodybuilder. And within two weeks, you are hanging your sweatshirt on the weight bench. And within six weeks, you're putting your grocery bags and boxes on it. 
And then within two months, that weight bench is down in your basement, forgotten about gathering dust. I knew that it would be very easy <clears throat> for me to come up with excuses to not work on this project if I just said, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. So I gave myself that, that bruising pace of one page per day to really force myself to keep going. And that actually turned out to be the only way I could have worked on this because it, it synced up perfectly with, with my obsessive and driven nature. Another one of the rules that I gave myself was to use, and I'll jump ahead here for a moment, but I'm going to jump back to this slide. I was going to use found paper. This is more difficult to explain. If you remember my earlier illustrations, they were intensely detailed, intensely, intensely detailed. And I had been doing that for so many years that the act of drawing was physically uncomfortable. It was also psychologically damaging to me because I began to develop an absolute terror of blank white spaces on the paper. I felt this obsessive need to cover every single square inch of any piece of paper that was put in front of me with lots and lots of details and color. All of this had sort of led me to a place where psychologically and physically the idea of art caused me a lot of discomfort. I didn't really know what to do until shortly before this project I had experimented with using some of this found paper and where this came from was I spent a number of years working in a used bookstore and customers would bring in their old books for us to resell but there was often a lot of material that we simply could not resell not even for a nickel. If someone brings in a set of engineering textbooks from the 1950s no one is going to buy that at all not even for a nickel. So we would do what we could could, we would try to recycle them, we would try to find homes for them, but if not, we would simply pitch them in a dumpster. So as someone who grew up in a house full of books, who was passionate about books, passionate about images all his life, this was very painful for me to do if I was the one that had to wheel the cart out to the dumpster. I also remember, um, have any of you seen that, that documentary called Scratch, which is about hip hop culture and the rise of the DJ? Not many people have. There's a fascinating moment in that documentary where DJ Shadow is in the basement of a large record store in Los Angeles and he's digging through these very, very dusty crates full of old forgotten about records and he's sort of ruminating about these records. He's, he's talking about how for him that's a very humbling experience because he himself is a recording artist and he realized that by seeing these records down there, by sort of mining these records for material, in a sense he's sort of tapping into what at one time was someone else's dream. All of these records laying forgotten about in this basement just rotting and molding were at one time the result of hard work and dreams by someone else. And so he said he always wanted to keep that in perspective as he moved forward as a musician and a performer. I thought of that as well when throwing these books out, that even though I had no idea I would ever be a published artist at the time, that this material that I was tossing out, whether it was just these electronic diagrams or some other book of maps or charts, it represented someone's life. It represented someone's hopes and dreams and ambitions. And there was something very humbling to me about uh, holding on to that and thinking that at some point I might be able to give it a new life. So I began experimenting with this paper shortly before beginning the Moby Dick project and my attempt was to actually sort of explode the way I was making art up till this point. To lose that sense of psychological and physical tension. To lose that feeling that I had to actually master that blank white space in front of me. Because by having to cope with paper that already had someone else's marks on it, I would either go completely mad trying to master it or I could simply let it go. I could work with it instead of against it. So I had a few abortive experiments prior to this, but I began using the found paper almost exclusively, especially at the beginning of this Moby Dick project, and it really was the most perfect process of creative destruction that I could have ever come across as an artist. I also realized very quickly, right after this first illustration, that this for me was the only way to illustrate Moby Dick. Just as one can read the novel and simply read sort of the surface narrative, you know, the story of Ahab's obsessive chase of this whale, you could look at all of these illustrations that I've done and you could simply look at the marks that I've made on the page and see my reactions, see my visuals, see my depiction of this novel. But if you choose to read and reread and re-reread Moby Dick, revisiting passages, spending time really carefully considering Melville's words, you will obviously see that there are whole oceans of meaning, layers and layers and layers of ideas beneath this sort of surface story of the chase after this whale. And so I wanted my illustrations to be a visual parallel to the structure of the novel. You would see my marks on the top, you would see the surface narrative shown through my illustrations, but if you chose to spend time looking closer, you would see strange juxtapositions. You might even begin to come to conclusions and forge connections on your own that might have been unintentional on my part, might, or it might have even been something that I was unaware of. 
So that explains the use of the found paper. My process throughout this entire 552 days, or 552 pages, I'm sorry, was to read several chapters ahead. I had read the book eight times prior to this. To read several chapters ahead, to familiarize myself with where I was in the flow of the story, and then each morning I would wake up and the first thing I did would be to read a page, the page that I was to illustrate that day. It was very important for me to move sequentially through the novel. I wanted to see how these illustrations and how my visions of these characters and this great narrative would evolve and that couldn't happen if I was jumping around. So I needed to move sequentially through the story. I would read the page each morning and I would obsess over that page, reading and reading and reading and reading it until something on that page, something in the text, some character, some, some passage, some phrase, some bit of dialogue provoked a response in me. And often the difficult part of this was narrowing it down to just one. I feel that for many of these pages I could have done three or four or five pieces. So it was important to sort of narrow it down to just one. And when I had settled on that particular line, I had found a strong reaction to that line, I would close the book and go to work. And I would obsess over the image all day long, going over and over and over and over in my mind what it was I was going to create later that evening. I would never sketch anything out. I would never uh, explore it with, with any kind of pre-planning or sketching at all. It was important for me that these be as intuitive and visceral and immediate as possible. So I would compose the image in my mind completely and when it was done I would begin and I would work as quickly as possible. This entire thing took place in a closet. Uh, my wife and I had some strange living circumstances at the time and we were living in one room of a house. Well, there was a bathroom too. And so the only place for my studio was this four by seven closet. There was just enough room in there for my drawing table, <clears throat> a bookshelf, some art supplies, and some of that found paper. And if you look carefully at this image, you can see on the top shelf many library discards and other books. Those were things that I was harvesting found paper from. The shelf below that shows a number of art supplies. The drawing table there, if you look carefully, you can see in the upper left-hand corner a Xeroxed photo of Melville. And I didn't know a whole lot about him individually at the time. Uh, just a little bit that I had read as an undergraduate and, and from reading introductions. But he and I had many conversations in that closet. And so this, this sort of pseudo-Melville developed from, from my own brain, my own fevered imaginings. And uh, he was a rather stern taskmaster. He's not smiling in this picture at all, and that really sort of kept me going because I felt this strange urge to please him, even though I, I have no idea what he might actually think of what I had done. So at this time in my life, we had a three-hour commute. So I would wake up every day at 5.45. I would go to work by 7. I would get home by 6.30 or 7. I would eat a quick dinner, and then I would disappear into the studio, often for hours on end, to work on the art. And by the time I came out, my wife was generally sleeping, and I would go to bed and toss and turn, thinking about whatever I was going to do the next day. And this really sort of drove that obsession that obsession of mine to, to really complete it. At the beginning of this project, I identified very heavily with Ishmael because I felt like a passenger. I felt like I was being carried along this grand narrative, and, and my only task was very specific, which was to create these illustrations showing uh, what I had seen in my mind all the time. But as the project wore on and a number of things happened, I did become more and more obsessed with completing it and the parallels between my own task and Ahab's obsession were very, very clear. Um, it became a book in a very strange way. So I started posting these illustrations on August, I think it was August 5th. I know that's the day I began. I don't know if I posted one that first day. I started putting them on a blog and a lot of people think that I did that so that I could, I use this phrase all the time, you heard it earlier in class today, because I think it's very amusing actually. A lot of people think I did this so that I could leverage the power of social media and get myself a book deal. Because apparently that was a thing at the time, turning blogs into books. That, that uh, Julia Child thing that, that became a book and then a movie, that became, began as a blog. This is going over what everybody said. <clears throat> but I didn't. The only reason I began putting them on a blog was because my mother lived in Florida. And I wanted her to see them. That was really it. She knew about my obsession with the book and I just wanted my mom to be able to see what I was doing. But within a very, very short amount of time, like five days I think, people began to find out about this. And this was very strange for me because I had had a website since 2006. So for three years all of my art had been online and no one, literally no one other than maybe ten friends and my mom had heard of me. 
So I went from total obscurity in the span of about a year and a half to having an agent and a book deal, which was very, very strange. And I have no illusions that they came to this because of my work initially. I think that they liked what they saw, all of these people that I'll tell you about in a moment. But I know that they came to this because it was Moby Dick, which again, I didn't realize at the time. You see, my experiences with Moby Dick had always been very solitary. I was unaware of this enormous fellowship of Melvillians out there because my experiences with Moby Dick, reading it in junior high and high school and, and undergraduate and as an adult and in graduate school, my constant explorations of this book, my constant wrestling with the novel, trying to understand it and learning more and more every time, and you use the word today, inexhaustible, this inexhaustible novel that kept rewarding me as a reader, those were always in solitude. I mean, other than a few very close friends that I would sometimes talk about Melville with as an undergraduate, I really had no idea that it remained as popular as it was. But within a very short time of me beginning to put these online, people started to find out about the project. People that were rabid for any sort of mention of Moby Dick. And I remember the very first thing that happened after five days was Meg Guroff, who runs this website. It's an annotated version of Moby Dick online. It's called PowerMobyDick.com. She emailed me, and she asked if she could interview me. And I remember specifically forwarding her email to my wife and asking her which one of our friends is messing with me. Because <laughs> I didn't believe that anyone would, would want to interview me. Because again, total obscurity. But she told me, because she's much more rational than I am, she said, you're being silly. This is a legitimate request. Go ahead and do the interview. And I did. And instantly, more and more people began visiting the blog. And strangers, people who I'd never met, began commenting on it. And so over the course of time, it was almost as if this sort of Pequod was developing on this blog. All of these strangers from all over the world were becoming a part of this journey. And while I never, ever created an image specifically to please anyone, it was actually a very positive experience to be able to share these with people who were very passionate about the novel and also very honest about what they thought because not all of the comments were positive. Some of them were critical, but they were given in a very balanced way and I really appreciated that. After working on this for about, oh, I was up to around page 200, I was invited to go to Brooklyn to give a presentation about this project of mine as part of something called OCD. It's, it, really, yeah, the joke is inherent. Uh, according to the guy that, struck, that, that was running this program, it stands for Open City Dialogues, but we all know what it stands for. So I did some research, and it actually was a big joke at my expense because this guy actually finds people with strange obsessions, and he gets them to come out to this bar, of all things, called Pete's Candy Shop in Brooklyn and talk about their bizarre obsessions. But anyway, my wife and I are always looking for an excuse to go to New York City. We've gone there dozens of times, so it was in the spring and we were anxious to get there. So I said, okay, I'll go. I was about 200 pages into it and all I did was show some of the images and talk about it. I was very nervous because, you know, Brooklyn and New York are one of the centers of the art world, not the only, but one. And so I felt again that sort of sense of terror that, you know, what does this guy, this librarian from Ohio, this self-taught artist have to show to these people that's not going to be something like they've seen before. So I, I really started to get worried and I wished I hadn't agreed to it, but I went ahead with it anyway and it actually went shockingly well. They really seemed to get what I was doing. So it was a very positive experience and that is actually what led directly to having a book. The event was written about in the Brooklyn free paper and a children's picture book illustrator, a professional picture book illustrator, who was also a big fan of Moby Dick, saw the write-up and looked at the blog and sent me an email and was the first to mention the possibility of a book, saying that her best friend was a literary agent and could he look at it, which I thought was an odd question because it was online. I could hardly say no, but I told her, sure, go ahead, because I didn't expect to hear from him. Within two days, he emailed me, effusively heaping praise upon me, saying that this was a fantastic project and he would like to represent me. I, it was funny because I gave him a really hard time for about two weeks. I was always of the impression that agents were nothing but parasites and vampires who lived off the creativity of others. And I more or less told him that. And I was pretty horribly abusive to him for about two weeks. But the thing that's astounding about it is that he never let up and he never gave up and he actually proved himself to be that rarest of things, which is a decent human being. And he earned my trust and I believed he actually really did care about seeing this thing turned into a book. So I signed with him because I figured only two things can happen. It will either become a book or it will be exactly what I had intended it to be in the first place. So there's no way I could lose. So I went ahead and signed the agreement <clears throat> and before I was even halfway done, 
with the illustrations, uh, I had been offered a contract by a publisher. That was one of the strangest days of my life because I actually didn't draw for an entire day. I was experiencing so much mental volatility. I started to ask myself all these questions like, have I sold out? Have I somehow compromised my vision for this project? Have I done a terrible thing by accepting money for what I wanted to do for purely personal reasons? <clears throat> So it, it took me nearly the entirety of that 24 hours to wrestle this project back under control for myself. And it was only with a lot of internal profanity that I finally managed to convince myself that I just needed to continue to forge ahead in the way that I had always seen it uh, taking shape in my mind. So I had a deadline now, and I had an agreement, and I had accepted money, and, and, and that was a lot of pressure on me. So I kept working every single day throughout, this, throughout the entire year of 2010. I took art supplies with me on vacation, which my wife was not pleased about. I worked in hotel rooms. I worked in airports. I worked when I was sick. And over time, I began to actually really resent this project, and this is where I started to feel like Ahab. I hated it because it was robbing me of every single thing in life which brought me joy. All I could do, my entire existence was defined by this obsessive need to create these illustrations. And it was driving me insane. And I realized that there were really only two ways out of this. Um, I could either commit suicide <laughs> or I could complete it. Those were the only two choices. I have never broken my word. I'm a person of integrity. When I say I'm going to do something, I do it. So just stopping, taking a break, none of those were options for me. And so I became actually, like Ahab, a fairly horrible human being. And um, I began putting up all sorts of walls between myself and other people because to me, as I got closer and closer to the end, this idea of spending time with friends, this idea of friends, actually, it seemed like a hindrance. You know, they were people that were getting in the way of what for me was the real work. It was awful. It was an awful thing to do. But I kept pushing forward, and, and uh, you know, I started losing sleep. I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would be obsessively thinking about whatever the next illustration was, because I knew that the faster I worked, the quicker I could get to the end. And so sometimes I would go to sleep at, say, 11 PM. I would wake up by 2, work in the studio for three hours, go back to sleep for an hour, and then get up again. And this went on and on and on through the winter and through those awful, bleak, horrific, and nihilistic chapters at the very, very end of the book. And then suddenly it was over. I had never allowed myself to look forward. I had never allowed myself to count the pages until the end. I knew that to do that would be to really weaken my will and to weaken my resolve. So I took it a day at a time, the same as any sailor or harpooner on the, que or on the Pequod would have taken it. And so the end came to me rather suddenly, uh, almost without me realizing it. I had always known what I wanted to do for the final image because in a sense it was an echo of this first image, not because the story is cyclical in any way, but because for me it was important to come back to why I had begun in the first place. And so on January 29th, a Saturday afternoon, I remember finishing the final piece. And I had anticipated being elated. I had thought that I would feel this tremendous lessening of pressure, that I would feel this tremendous kind of joy because my life had been returned to me, but I wasn't. I was actually very devastated. I wept for a very long time upon finishing this project because even though I was free and even though I had done what I set out to do and even though I had created something that I was extraordinarily and enormously proud of, it was very, very sad to see it over. Because you see, for me, even in all of those late, late nights, all of those hours of solitude in that tiny closet in Ohio with the snow coming down all around me, being completely sequestered away from the world, having pushed my friends away and my wife away and having chosen this solitary path through this novel, these characters were always there for me. See, I had become very, very close to them all. They were at times more real to me than the real world. And so in finishing this task and in creating these illustrations, I felt that in a sense I had been complicit in sending them to this watery grave. It was a very strange feeling to have. Uh, and it took me a long time to get over that. I did not draw anything at all for two months. I, I simply concentrated on trying to get back to the rest of the world and fortunately trying to reconnect with friends who had never really given up hope on me anyway since they were very empathetic about what I was going through.
And then the fun began, and then the book came out, and I was able to do all sorts of amazing things like come here and talk to you. So what I'm going to do to wrap this up, and then I will answer any questions you may have, is show you a few of my favorite pieces and read to you the line of text, which is what each of these pieces illustrates. So each of these illustrations you're going to see is going to be a response to a particular passage from the novel. This is page one, Call Me Ishmael. Page 20, and this is where that, that lifetime of reading comics really paid off. I was aware from the very beginning I was going to have to draw these characters again and again and again and again. And as you know, if you've read a comic book, Superman or Wolverine has to look the same in every single panel. If he looks like a different person, then the comic book artist is not doing their job. So I needed to build for myself a visual vocabulary that I was capable of repeating and it would also instantly signify to the viewer of these pieces each character that I was suggesting and reusing and revisiting. This is Queequeg. Page 20, Lord save me, thinks I. That must be the harpooner, the infernal head peddler. Page 30, Yes, here were a set of sea dogs, many of whom had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking. Page 66, take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod. She was a ship of the old school, rather small if anything, with an old-fashioned claw-footed look about her. And it really is ballpoint pen. Page 117, reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter deck. Now, if you've been paying attention throughout this presentation, you will notice that some of the elements of those early drawings were creeping back in. I found that in spite of that creative destruction, that this was generally the way that I draw, that obsessively detailed, precise, and regular style. And I think I have finally accepted that. Page 121, as he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. My wife went to Boston for a conference for a weekend, and that was the weekend of the Cytology chapter. So I did nothing that weekend but draw and sleep and occasionally eat. And so I was able to create some very, very large detailed pieces. This is one of my favorites. And the Cytology chapter is one of my favorites because I like the obsessive cataloging of information. Page 131, the finback is not gregarious. He seems a whale hater, as some men are man haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters. This must have been a popular piece because someone got it tattooed on their back. This is one of the only times that I actually made any sort of intentional connection to the work of the artist that had explored the novel before me. I definitely kept this kind of work at arm's length because I knew that to think about the work of Benton Spruance and Rockwell Kent and Leonard Baskin and Frank Stella would be to a, 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 an artist struggling to find his way like me, a way of crushing me into feeling completely insignificant. So I kept it all at arm's length, but this was one passage where I felt I really wanted to make that connection with those who had gone before me. This is, of course, a piece by Rockwell Kent. This is my homage to that, page 155. Captain Ahab said, Tashtigo, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Page 176 is, this is one of the only times I actually worked on a page from the book. A lot of people ask me why did I not do that more often. The simple answer is I felt it was an easy gimmick. It was something that was a little too pat and a little too cute, so I didn't do that often. The reason that I did it here uh, was I wanted a lot of that white space, and if you look closely at the bottom of this image and you see that green, that's water damage, which seemed very appropriate. Page 176, the rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end he had gained his distinctive appellation of the white whale, a name indeed literally justified by his vivid aspect when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea, leaving a Milky Way wake of creamy foam all spangled with golden gleamings. Page 357, instead of sparkling water, he now spouts red blood. This is a self-portrait, how the project began to feel. Page 362, he is both ponderous and profound. Page 374, then with the tapering force of his parting momentum, we glided between the two whales into the innermost heart of the shoal. 
You can definitely see that old style coming back. And of course, this is one of my favorite parts of the book as well. This is the chapter when Pip is lost at sea and then recovered. Page 402, not drowned entirely though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes. And the miser merman wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps. And among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, God-omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. Page 464. So in good time, my Queequeg gained strength, and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then springing into the head of his hoisted boat and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. One of the many, many things I love so much about this novel is that as that child who was obsessed with the fantastic, there are passages of this novel where you almost get the feeling that this ship is no longer sailing on earthly seas. And this is one of those passages, page 484. All the yard arms were tipped with a pallid fire and touched at each tri-pointed lightning rod end with tapering white flames. Each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulfurous air like gigantic wax tapers before an altar. Page 513, as the unsetting polar star, which through the livelong Arctic six months night sustains its piercing, steady, central gaze, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. Page 520, another self-portrait. Forty years on the pitiless sea, for forty years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land, for forty years to make war on the horrors of the deep. This, for me, is the piece, the central axis of the entire series. And I didn't realize that until this piece was completed. This, for me, is the perfect distillation of everything that I had done before and everything that would come after. This is where everything crystallized perfectly with these series of illustrations for a lot of reasons. One of the biggest, even in terms of how it relates to the text, is that prior to this, throughout the entire book, every mention of Moby Dick is a secondhand mentioning. Some sailor or harpooner saying, oh yes, I've heard mention of this whale, or I remember being in a tavern and hearing someone talk about this whale, or isn't this the whale that did this to a certain captain? And even though there had been some brief sightings of the whale by the members of the, the crew, it had always just been Moby Dick's tail or Moby Dick's forehead or Moby Dick's hump or Moby Dick's spout, but this is the moment, and it's amazing that this comes on page 534 with only 18 pages remaining in the novel. This is the moment where all of those ideas are brushed away. All of that doubt as to what really is Moby Dick. Is it even real? Is this whale real? Or is it something that's just a phantom or a phantasm? Is it a legend? Is it a myth? Is it God's will incarnate? Or is it a dumb brute? All of those crystallize in this perfect moment when Moby Dick breaches from the ocean and the crew can see the entirety of the whale for the first time and the reality settles over both the crew and the reader. The passage is Moby Dick bodily burst into view for not by any calm and indolent spoutings, not by the peaceable gush of that mystic fountain in his head did the white whale now reveal his vicinity, but by the far more wondrous phenomenon of breaching. Rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm whale thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of air and piling up a mountain of dazzling foam, shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In those moments, the torn, enraged waves he shakes off seem his mane. In some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance. It's interesting what you mentioned earlier about uh, Moser and his approach. This was the only time in my illustrations where I felt that I could add nothing, literally nothing, to Melville's words. So the illustration became his words, and you'll see these are all repeated. This is a, a tremendously moving passage from Starbuck. Great God, but for one single instant show thyself. Never, never wilt thou capture him, old man, he's speaking to Ahab. In Jesus' name, no more of this. That's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, thy very leg once more snatched from under thee, thy evil shadow gone. All good angels mobbing thee with warnings. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? 
Oh, oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. This, too, was apparently a very successful piece because this was a gift from my editor. That is not the original. That is a, a repainted version of it. It didn't fit in the closet. <laughs> this is the only time I felt the pressure of expectations. These lines, whether you read Moby Dick or not, you will know, especially if you've watched Star Trek. I knew that people would come to this with some kind of expectation, so I struggled a bit. But again, in the end, it was uh, what I had always seen. Page 550, towards thee I roll, thou all-destroying but unconquering whale. To the last I grapple with thee. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Sink all coffins and all hearses to one common pool. And since neither can be mine, let me then tow to pieces while still chasing thee, though tied to thee, thou damned whale. Thus I give up the spear. And the final page. Page 552, and just as the first page was the first line of the book, this is the last line of the epilogue. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan. Have any questions? If you have a question, just try to, like, yes. Did you ever find the, the found pages kind of actually influencing your composition in Yeah, and I keep meaning that to, to sort of restructure this presentation because there are some pieces that, especially through um, the passage of time and being able to look back at them uh, with some separation from the project, I have been able to sort of analyze, hey, Sally, uh, better. Uh, that's an old friend of mine from Ohio who now lives out here. I'm very happy to see her. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, I'm going to draw on her book. I'm very excited to see her. Yeah, uh, th there are a few, and, and I wish I could include them in here. Um, it was never overt. It was never something really terribly specific. It was, it was never me wanting to really sort of focus on a particular word or, or chart or anything like that. It was more a thematic thing. So, for example, I can show you a few here. I mean, I talked about the, the page from Moby Dick, you know, obviously the water damage and, and the white space, so that was both an aesthetic and a thematic consideration. Um, this one here for Queequeg, you know, much is made of Queequeg being this foreigner. Much is made of his otherness. And I thought, what better way to show that than, of course, a map of some portion of the, the sort of South Asian, South Pacific area. So in a lot of, t in a lot of ways, and you know, this is something that, that took me a while to be comfortable with, too. You know, my symbolism is not terribly sophisticated. Uh, you know, maybe that might be different if I had the benefit of a BFA or an MFA. Maybe not. I really don't know. Um, I like to think that this is a fairly direct engagement with the book. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of deeply hidden, mysterious connections that would require uh, two or three PhDs to sift through, at least not on an intentional level. A lot of the symbolism and a lot of the connections were fairly broad like this. Um, more often than not, I chose the paper uh, sort of subconsciously, and that's why finding some of those juxtapositions later on was almost unsettling because I believed I was sort of onto something that I didn't even really realize at the time. Hmm? Yes? Did you ever uh, come across a situation where you felt that the, the illustration that you worked on or attempted or completed didn't work for you? You either had an accident with it, it didn't live up to your expectations, and you had to rework it somehow? I had. If so, did yeah, yeah. I had two accidents. Um, what happened with those was that the found paper was simply not a good enough foundation, so it, it sort of disintegrated with the wet media. Those were really the only two times that, that I uh, was really sort of forced to reconsider. There, there were a handful of alternate illustrations, and with that, it was, it was less, um, less an issue of me feeling like something wasn't working and more an issue of me having too many ideas and needing to explore it two or three times before I could evaluate which I thought was the closest to what I had intended. And it was strange. That, that happened more and more near the end rather than near the beginning. So I'm not sure what happened there because I actually felt 
you know, and, and maybe this is actually what did happen. Near the end of this project, I had a, a kind of confidence in my artistic abilities that, that was unprecedented for me. I felt like an absolute master near the end. I felt truly like I could do anything that I set my hand to as an artist. And so you would think that that would make me more certain, but I think maybe what it was was that now all of these things were within my grasp, things which I may have been too afraid to explore and to tackle prior to these last 50 to 100 pages now seemed well within the realm of my abilities. And I think that's why more of the alternates began creeping in. They were generally fairly similar. There weren't drastic departures. It was more like a change of angle or a shift in the medium, perhaps. And uh, I would usually just talk to my wife about it. She became a real partner in this with me, even though she did not do uh, any of the illustrations. She, in addition to just being an essential part of my life, it's Ione, you remember Ione, Sally. Uh, in addition to being an essential part of my life, became a real crucial partner because we were able to really, uh, really dig into this together and talk about, you know, where is this going? What's successful? I think she's, she's really in tune with what I'm doing as, as an artist, and um, I can't imagine any of this, you know, without her as a sounding board. You know, she, she often talks, sometimes she comes to these things and people ask her questions, which is, I think is always wonderful and kind of hilarious too, and she seems really taken aback. But, you know, she was there for every one of these. So she saw them as, as if she wasn't asleep. As soon as I came out of the studio, she was the first to see every piece. So she really had a front row seat to this all, you know, which is why I really feel that these illustrations in this book, it, it belongs to both of us. I kind of went all over the place there. Did that address your question? <laughs> I get excited because I miss my wife. Can you describe what kind of toll this took on your physical and emotional well-being? Was it torture? Yeah, it really was. It really was. I, I hate the winter as it is. Um, I really, really hate the winter. I can't stand snow or ice or cold. And it's so dark. It's so dark in Ohio. You know, the sun seems to come up at noon and, and set at 3 during January. So, you know, that's something that I struggle with every year. And I was finishing this and in working through the most harrowing parts of the novel, as well as being in the deepest grips of my obsession at that particular time. I really cannot give enough credit at all. There are, no, there are not enough superlatives to describe the patience and the understanding and the empathy of my friends and my wife and my family because I was a horrible person. I mean, I was, I was actively rude in shutting people out and, in, and saying to them, you know, spending time with you is not important right now. I don't need to see you. And I think that that's, that's the worst part of, of the toll that it took. It wasn't just, you know, the torture of, of the deprivation and the solitude, but it was in, in realizing that I was becoming a monster and sort of feeling complicit in it. You know, I knew that I could stop it at any time. I knew I could just be a better person. I knew that if I stretched it out and maybe just worked on art every day but completed a piece every two days, I could go out for a beer with my friends, but I didn't. You know, I had sort of created this falsely ennobled persona in my mind, you know, that I was engaged in this, this high and important work. And, and I'm still proud of it, but, you know, that was foolish. And, and I'll never be that way again. And, and ever since I completed it and crawled out from under that hole and had the opportunity to go to all these places and talk to people, you know, I've really been able to keep a lot of perspective. I, I've worked on, on getting back the sense of humility that I lost because I was an arrogant bastard. I really was. It's, it's kind of, I think it's funny. People laugh nervously, and you should laugh nervously because it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. And sometimes people will say, oh, would you do this again? And I say, no, never, never, ever would I voluntarily pay this price again. I'm really proud of what resulted. I look at my own book and I really think, that's awesome. But I would never again voluntarily pay that price. I paid a heavy price for this. I lost a year and a half of my life. I mean, it's just gone. It's there. It's between those two covers. So for a year and a half, that's me. There was nothing else but that. Nothing. Yeah. Um, what was your process with Heart of Darkness like in writing That's a fascinating question because it addresses all sorts of issues about the publishing industry. Heart of Darkness, so having an agent is weird. He has a vested interest in me continuing to work. So after the Moby Dick book had come out and it had done well, apparently done well financially, um, he gave me a few months and then he asked me what I wanted to do next. And he said, I think you need to illustrate another one or two books before you have the clout, the credibility to, to do something original, which was fine because I really like illustrating. So I gave him a, a very short list of books uh, which I had wanted to illustrate 
two more of which, there, there are, are four books that have really shaped me as a person, and, and two of them were on there. And uh, it was funny, he said he thought Heart of Darkness would be the least likely to get selected by the publisher because it was in some ways thematically similar uh, to, to some of Moby Dick. You know, Conrad and Melville are often talked about together. Um, but I, I think, and maybe this is a testament, you know, to the lack of daring and courage in the publishing industry because they want more of the same because it's, it's guaranteed profits. Uh, they wanted Heart of Darkness. That was a very strange thing for me because I was aware from the very beginning it was going to be a book. And I was aware from the very beginning that it was going to be consumed and it needed to be marketable and all of these things. So I, I you know, I thought about that a lot uh, because I couldn't let that affect me. You know, it still had to be what I saw. And, and these illustrations, I mean, these are what I saw. When I read Heart of Darkness, you know, in high school and college, the, all of these illustrations that you see around you, you know, that's how the book has looked to me for years. It's not as if I came up with these while I was working on the book. About the only changes, significant changes I made while illustrating Heart of Darkness, uh, well, one was to, to spread out the pace so that I did not have to spend every single day with Kurtz, you know. My, and I thank my wife for that because my friends were joking with me when they learned it would be 100 illustrations. They said, well, that'll take you three months. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. Like I said, I'm not going to pay that price again, especially with Kurtz. I mean, Moby Dick is howlingly funny in places. There's no humor in Heart of Darkness, none, <laughs> just none at all. It's hell. And so my wife, I thank her for that. She said, no, you know, you need to stretch this out. You need to negotiate a better deadline with them. And I did, and that enabled me to really have some balance while working on this but also made me have to spend nine months with Kurtz instead of just three months. Um, so that was, you know, that was a part of the process, but a, a bigger part of it, and perhaps the biggest change that I made was, you know, these illustrations are all over the place. Different media, different styles of representation. You know, I was touching a lot of different things here. Paint, ballpoint pen, ink. I thought that this would be the last thing I ever did as an artist, so I wanted an opportunity to explore all of these things because I thought I might never get a chance to again. With Heart of Darkness, I was much more uh, cognizant of making it a very consistent visual narrative. These are a mosaic of impressions from the book. What I attempted to do with Heart of Darkness was to create a visual, a distinct visual accompaniment. Uh, you could not, unless you're familiar with Moby Dick, it is unlikely you could look at my illustrations and get a sense of, of the specifics of the story. I mean, you'd get an idea, but there, there's not a kind of narrative flow the way there would be in a graphic novel or storyboards or something like that. With Heart of Darkness, though, I really made a, a strong attempt to have those illustrations be very visually consistent to work with one another as a long sequential depiction of what was occurring in the story in a slightly abstract way. I mean, it's not a terribly realistic uh, representation. And I was exploring the ideas of the novel more so than just the action, but that, that was my working process for that. So, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to have a third book, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I like to try different things. I get very restless, very, very, very bored if I have to do the same thing over and over again. And so whatever it is will be a different, uh, you know, a different way of engaging with a story. Uh, there's probably time for like one or two more. I'll do two more because I don't like it for me. Yes? What are the other books? <laughs> People always ask that. Uh, so there was Moby Dick, Heart of Darkness, and they're actually in this presentation. So I'll show you the covers. This book, which no one has ever heard of, apparently. Uh, this is a book I read in high school, and it's a book about Gnosticism. It's, it's got a horrible title, and it's got a horrible framing device. But it's a very interesting story about a, a, you know, a man from Earth that goes to this planet that's revolving around the, the star Arcturus. And it's very episodic. It's almost like a pilgrim's progress in a sense. And he has these, these episodic encounters with different beings on this planet. And each one is really sort of a thinly veiled allegory of this man debating certain religious philosophies. And strangely enough, many of these episodes end with some act of violence or murder. But it's also an intensely visual book. And it introduced me at a young age to an enormous array of ideas, which I don't think I would have had the fortune to encounter uh, you know, outside of, of being an undergrad or having some exceptionally enlightened friends. This is the one I want to do the most. And every time I tell my agent that I'd like to illustrate this book, he says to me the same thing. And he's very honest, and I appreciate that. He says, if you want to illustrate this, I heartily encourage you to. Um, but I can tell you right now that no one will publish it, no one has heard of it, and no one cares. <laughs> And that's probably true. Has anyone in here read it? You've read it. Yes. So, uh, well, we'll talk later. <laughs>
I'll ask you. <laughs> I'm curious about whether you like it or, you know, because it's, again, it's a polar, I've read some scathing things about this book, and it's, it's far from a perfect book. It was written in 1920, and I believe he only wrote mysteries after that, right, and some plays, and uh, it's, it's long out of print. It's in the public domain. Um, he's, my agent is kind of right. Very few people care about this book. The other, which I would actually never illustrate, is uh, these books, the Gorman Gas Trilogy by Mervyn Peake. Mervyn Peake himself was an artist and an illustrator, and I could add nothing to his stories that he did not already depict sublimely with his own illustrations. So these are, are more important to me in terms of just the story itself and, and my association with seeing his illustrations as I read the story. Okay, one more. You. It, it was really very conscious. I was very conscious of that. It was, um, it was something that was, was absolutely important to me. And, and again, a lot of that has to do with what I said at, at earlier on, where I felt that this might be the last thing I ever did as an artist. And, and I had spent so much of my life uh, absorbing all of these images. And I, I really felt the need to sort of, in a sense, say goodbye to them. You know, I wanted to sort of touch them and pick them up one more time. So I, I would, made a real conscious effort to, you know, in some ways, I am uh, um, you know, per perhaps this is a negative, but I'm really driven by nostalgia since so much of what I do is part of a, a direct connection with the, the person I remember being as a child. Uh, there's a quote, and it actually sort of relates directly to this tattoo. There's a, there's a, a quote by Frederick Schiller, I think. It's in Nathaniel Philbrick's book, Why Read Moby Dick? And it, 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 he talks about how when Herman Melville passed away and they were going through his belongings, they discovered this portable writing desk he had, and it had a hollow bottom. And uh, taped to the inside of this portable writing desk was this quote from Schiller, and it said, keep true to the dreams of thy youth. And so, you know, one can never really know why Melville did that. We can project all sorts of things onto that, and I do. I mean, I don't really care why he put it there, because what matters is why I think he put it there. And I'd like to think that that idea, keeping true to those dreams of his youth, was a big part of what drove him to continue writing, even in the face of obscurity and commercial failure. And so what drives me to continue making art really is, again, that, that strong sense of wonder that I experienced as a young person, you know, looking at these images for the first time, seeing these worlds open up to me as I read books and, and even read comics and, and just saw, you know, beyond what, what was right in front of me. Uh, so all, I think all of what I do really has some level of connection with, with that childhood. Those are my inspirations. That's where I came from. And, and while I sometimes think I need to hurl myself boldly forward and do something completely unexpected and unmoored, uh, I, I don't know if it's time for that yet, um, but I'm not that old. I have a lot of time left in me, so maybe at some point I'll get to that. But right now, I'm still, I'm, I'm still going back and re-exploring those old pathways. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you.